what he did with his patients. Now, I'm going to tell you exactly what he recommended, and I'm going to ask you, you think you can do this? First thing, he increased the fiber in the people's diets. Now, one thing, if you know anything about Kellogg, he was really big on a clean colon. <laughs> because in the colon, if you've got a nasty colon, it can cause you lots of problems. So he gave them high fiber foods, okay? So that's going to help the motility, it's going to help the, the uh, peristaltic, it's going to help the whole alimentary canal get clean. Second thing, each patient got three and a half to four liters of liquids a day. Now, is, is water a law of health? How much should we drink? I don't know. We should be drinking three and a half to four quarts a day. People say, well, if I do that, I'll have to go to the bathroom a lot. Yeah, probably will. At least you have a nice urinary system cleaned out. They'll say, well, I'll flush all my electrolytes out. You've got to drink an awful lot of water to really do any damage to yourself. We're talking about gallons and gallons and gallons. So he had them three and a half to four liters of, and I say fluids, it wasn't just water. He was giving them other things. Third thing, and this is the part that I don't like, each patient got two enemas a day until the water ran clean. Didn't I tell you that Kellogg really liked a clean colon? It was squeaky clean when he got done. And the fourth thing, he did some hydrotherapy. It's good for increase in the immune response. We'll be talking about this on Sunday. Um, it's good for relaxing stiff muscles. It's, it's good for bringing down a temperature. Howard hydrotherapy, people call it a fever treatment. No, a fever is what God gives us ability to get. We can do hyperthermia. How can we take a, a hyperthermia treatment to bring down a temperature? All right, let me ask you this. What's the fourth angel's message? Oh. Huh? Exactly. It's Revelation chapter 18. And I saw another angel come down and say, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And then what does it say in verse 4? Come out of her, my people. Now, I'm not saying the church is Babylon. But many of us have Babylonian minds. We, we, we have grown up in a Babylonian system, have we not? And we're so immured, we're so bogged down in our Babylonian thinking that what do most people do if they get a headache? Take an aspirin. What do most people do when they get a fever? Take an aspirin. All right, what does an aspirin do First of all, does an aspirin bring down the temperature? It does. It works. How does it do that? Well, let's first understand the mechanism of raising the, we call it the thermoregular, yeah, we like big words, thermoregulatory um, set point. You, you've got a thermostat in your body. And a sit, what is your thermostat set at right now? What, what is yours? That's about, mine's about 97.5. When people say the, the normal temperature is 98.6, how many people's normal temperature is 98.6? Very few people. Why is it good to know what your set point is? So when you take your temperature and you think that normal is 98.6, but it's really 97.8, you say, oh, I'm normal. No, you've got a low-grade fever if you don't know what your normal was. Now, I'm getting ready to chase a rabbit. Remind me where I was. I already forget where I am right now. Where do we get normal values? How many have ever had a blood test? Okay, and you get all these things, your, your BUN, your, you know, all these different values, and they'll have normal ranges. Now, first of all, the doctor's gonna look at, yeah, everything's normal, and you put it in your file. You say, doctor, by law, that belongs to me. I want a copy of my, of my blood work. Because you've got to compare it. Then you've got to learn for yourself what do all of these things mean. Here's the problem. Where do they come up with normals? Huh? Insurance companies figure it out. Well, but, and how do they... 
what, what they do is, inform, whoever it is, they get about, about 10,000 people together. They take all their stuff, people with no known diseases. They average it, and that becomes normal. But here's the problem. The normal person, what, 50% are going to have heart disease, 30% or 40% is going to have cancer, or most of them are going to end up with diabetes. I don't want to be normal. Most people never consider me normal in the first place, but I want to find out what is the ideal number. What is the very best for me? So that's what we're looking for. So the ideal temperature is whatever yours is. Mine is low like yours is, and most of us, I would say, is probably low. When we get, we get, we get invaded by whatever it was, and the, the helper T cells, part of the immune system, notice we've got an invader in here, it sends a message to the hypothalamus, a little gland in the middle of your brain, and it controls the thermoregulatory set point, your thermostat. And it will say, it will produce prostaglandin E, it will go up there, and it turns up the temperature, let's say to 102. And, uh, and when that temperature goes up, your body starts producing more white blood cells. And they are moving faster now. Is that sound like a good thing? That's exactly what we want. We take an aspirin, it poisons the hypothalamus, no more prostaglandin E, the temperature comes down, and now the viruses, the whatever got into you, is multiplying exponentially. Have you heard of Tammy flu? Tammy flu, one of the things it does is bring down your temperature. A fever is a friend. Thank you. A fever is a friend. The fever is in there to help you get well. We should assist it. Now, I was... That's why I was chasing a rabbit. I was talking about taking hypothermia to bring the temperature down. So let's say your hypothalamus has moved up to 102, and you put somebody in a tank of water and take them to 103. What is the hypothalamus going to do? Turn down the thermostat. And when you take them out, they'll f you'll find the temperature's down. And while they're in there with a higher temperature, you produce even more white blood cells. Then you let the patient rest for Hour, their white blood cells, their immune system working at peak efficiency, and they're getting well. That's what God wants us to do. I was back, let's go back to the uh, third angel's message, the first angel's message. Fear God. What's the second part of the first angel's message? Give glory, Give glory to Him. Now, there's a Bible verse of that. I think it's 1 Corinthians. I always forget it. It's one that says, Whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do to the glory of God. So what we're putting into our bodies, what we're doing with our bodies, it either gives glory to God or it insults him and makes him weep. We need to think about these things. Everything that we do, I don't think that's, that's an extreme position. Will this make my Heavenly Father happy? Is it always easy? Growing up, my, my little girl, her favorite Bible verse was, um, <clears throat> Philippians 4.13, which is, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And that's what, that's what God wants to do with us. Can anyone just define disease for me? What is disease? Hmm? It's disease. Dis-ease. Okay, two words. Dis-ease. Lack of ease. Your, your homostasis, your equilibrium, whatever, it's off. You're, you're not easy. That's a good one. Any other definitions for disease? Well, that causes disease, but it's not disease itself. That's what might lead to it. What is a definition of disease? Hmm? A deviation from normal, that's good. Yeah, I'm sort of a deviation from normal. All right, it's the way, all right, let me give you the definition that Sister White gives. Disease is an effort of nature to free itself from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. So, and, and how do those, 
how does that usually manifest itself? The body fighting. How does it manifest itself? How about coughing? Is coughing a system of the body trying to clear the lungs of a problem? So, so why do we want to take a cough suppressant if the cough is trying to clear our lungs, our bronchial tree, whatever? So we, we work with it. So let's say, we're going to be talking about remedies on Sunday, but I'll mention this one right now because this is, and I'll tell this story again on Sunday. You're getting a sneak preview. There is, I live in an Amish and Mennonite community. Lots of Amish. The black bug, believe me, it's, it's a nightmare. They're galloping down, not, they're trotting down the road at nighttime. Everything's black. You've got to be really careful with these people. Some of them have big lights in the back, though. They're getting wise. They're wonderful people. But there is a man. He had, he, he was very sick. They took him to the hospital. The doctors examined him, and he says, they said, you are in serious condition. We're going to have to transport you up north to another hospital. And he says, I'd rather die at home. So he got up and left home, left the hospital and went home. Well, a lady in my church, she called me, and she says, what can we do? So we got to do fomentations. So I explained. She, she knew about them, but it had been a long time. I've, I've done thousands of fomentations. I told her step by step. Her son had some fomentations somewhere in the house. She took him to the man's house. She, now, all right, so I tell the lady from my church. She goes to the man's house, and she tells the Mennonite's daughter what to do. You know, we're talking about a, a 15-minute crash course on fomentations. The guy was well in a week. In a couple of days, no cough. He was doing great. Back to work again. He would have died in the hospital because they, anyway, I'm not going to get into that. But God has special ways for us to take care of ourselves. What's it say in 3 John 2? I would that thou would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. God wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be strong. He wants us to be well. And the reason why, there's many reasons why he wants us well. He wants us well because we can't work if we're sick. How many of you have been, now this isn't, this isn't a trick question. This isn't going to be pointing fingers at you because there's a reason for my asking this question. How many of you have had COVID in the last two years? Okay, good. Now, was it a, was it a pleasant experience Right? For some it's good, for not, some it's not. But we have to understand, if God allows us to go through an experience, I've had 16 broken bones, I've lost everything I owned twice, I've had surgeries, I've pretty much racked up my body. But I, when I read this verse, and I finally not just listened to it, when I heard what the Lord was telling me through this verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want you to find, I want you to give me one word about what this is experiencing. We'll talk about it a lot more tomorrow afternoon. But this is, when I understood these two verses, it was an epiphany. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Now I'm going to read it to you. Listen for a particular word that gets, keeps getting repeated. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. <laughs> what was the word? What's, what is the principle? What is this teaching us? First of all, let's say you're the person he's talking about. What's happened to you here? Something bad has happened because God had to comfort you. But the key word is that. The word that in verse 2. Who comforts all the tribulation, that. What's another word? For, what's another way to say in that? Hmm? Therefore, for this purpose. For this purpose that you might be able to comfort somebody else with the same comfort that God comforted you with. 
What's the word there? Empathy. See, sympathy's cheap. There's nothing wrong with sympathy. I, I remember when I was in the sixth grade, a classmate of mine lost his mother. I couldn't even fathom this. I couldn't get my mind around this, this Jim Lemming's mother's gone. I didn't get empathy until two years ago when I had to come back from Serbia. My sister wouldn't let me come because I was under quarantine and my mother died just before 97. I understand now. Because I, I had to be comforted a lot and I still mourn the loss of my mother. She was the most wonderful woman that ever walked this earth. I know some of you are pretty wonderful too, but um, that was my mama. Okay? So God allows things to happen to us for the purpose of being able to help somebody else going through the same thing. I remember years ago, we were at a, um, we would attend, a lot of us from UT Pines would go up to Auburn Opelika, Alabama, and go to a church there. We'd have Sabbath school, someone would have the sermon, we'd have fellowship meal, and then we'd scatter out through the area because we all had Bible studies we were doing every Sabbath afternoon. Let me tell you, if you want to have a rich experience, experience, study the Bible with somebody. One of my ladies was Kay Lou Tate. Kay Lou was an old black lady. She lived out in a cabin with no electricity in the middle of a cotton patch. It was antebellum all the way, pre-Civil War. Well, they decided one Saturday night to bring all of our contacts in. We'd have a program for them. You know, we're gonna, some people would play the piano. Some people would sing. I read a poem. We just, it was a nice evening. I was sitting back in, a, you know, in the middle back here, and, and I sit next to a black guy, and he's going to sing a song. And so his sister, and he gets up front. <coughs> he's all ready, and the panelist starts, and or, he starts off in the wrong key. So I had to stop and, you know, starts off, he's starting in the wrong key in the other direction. Then he forgot the word. It was the most miserable experience that a singer must have ever had. How do you think he felt? Miserable. So he comes back like a whipped dog. He gets into the pew, past me, goes all the way down to the end of the pew, sitting by himself. So I scooted over. I was going this way. I scooted over. Right next to him, I put my arm around him. And I just pulled him in close. He said, you know when you did that, he told me later, when you did that, all the embarrassment was gone. Aww. He says, I felt so good. Mm. That's empathy, because I've embarrassed myself many times. But God wants to take care of it. He wants to get us in a position where we can empathize with people. And the only way you can do that is let us go through the valley of the shadow of death. That's why Christ had to come. Even when, when, when Christ inspired the psalmist to write Psalm 22, verse 1, does anyone know what Psalm 22, verse 1 says? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that was a thousand years before he was on the cross saying to himself. But when he inspired it, he could not understand because he was God. He had no idea what hot, cold, hungry, thirsty, tired, pain. He knew none of these things. That's why Jesus had to come down here as a man and experience everything else because now he can empathize with us. He stands before his father and he says, Father, I know what it's like. I went through that thing. And he's sorry and his father says, I forgive him. It's wonderful the way it works. But now let's go back to, um, uh, we, we'll leave off the first angel's message. We'll get back to what disease is. Disease is an effort in nature to free itself from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. Then she gives three steps. First step is, first we have to ascertain what caused my sickness. What usually causes your sickness. Hmm? What you ate, okay. You did something wrong, okay. I flew to Ukraine some years ago. I was getting ready to do it. I was basically the Western Ukrainian uh, division evangelist. 
I did many evangelistic crusades. But you lose seven hours. I don't sleep well in airplanes. You get there, and the first Sabbath, I'm invited to a lady's house for lunch. And um, nice, I love Eastern European food. I like potatoes, cabbage, onions, garlic, and that's what you're getting over there. When she got done, she cleared the table, and she brought out a large platter of cookies. Not the cookies like you made today. These were not health reform cookies. These were cookies bought at the kiosk down in the street. Three main ingredients. It's going to be white flour, fat, and sugar. And she sat there in the middle of the table. And already my immune system's at half speed because I lost all that sleep. And I thought, oh, man, if I eat that, I'm going to get sick. And I said, well, but she's, she's gone to the expense. I will be very polite now. I'll eat one cookie. I'm a cookie monster. So, mm, <laughs> it was so good. I'll be doubly polite when I have another cookie. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I'll be triply polite. Quadruple, quintuple. You know, I don't know how many cookies I had, but for a week I was suffering on the verge of being very, very sick. I knew what caused my problem. Sugar will kill your immune system. When you're sick, when we're going through this thing right now, and that's the funny thing. I don't know how it is here in, in Boise, Idaho, or Middleton, all those places, but in, in, in um, Kentucky, you have to understand Kentucky hasn't advanced much since Davy Crockett went through. But here they are. They're, they're in COVID. They're wearing their mask. You're double masking. and they're driving down the road with no one in the car with their mask on and the windows rolled up. I don't know what their problem are, but they're there in their, their shopping cart and it's filled with little Debbies and sitting along the rails are Mountain Dew and Coca-Cola. You know, they put the six pack over the side so they get more in there. I'm thinking, what are they doing to their immune systems? They're killing themselves. And, yeah, I love Kentucky, but it's a sick, sick place. We started an LLC there last year, last July, to try to educate the people in our, in our community, uh, Liberty, Kentucky, and, and uh, Casey County. And uh, it's just hard to get them there because drugs, alcohol, tobacco. Well, it's a dry county, but that doesn't mean it's anything about that. So, um, okay, so we first ascertain what the problem was. Second step is quit doing it. <laughs> it's simple as that. If you're eating the wrong things, start eating the right things. If you're drinking the wrong things, Start drinking the right things. If you're doing the wrong things, start doing the right things. Third step, then you allow nature to assist you in establishing the right conditions of health. That means we can take some herbs. What's some good antibiotic herbs? Echinacea, very good. Golden seal, I got a bag of it. Garlic, Garlic. yeah, you, 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 your people all know these things. These things strength. Now, another good thing about garlic, you know, after that experience of getting sick that time, that was in the spring. I came back in the fall to do another advanced to crusade. Two crusades at one time. One from 4 to 5.30, one from 6 to 8.30. I mean, it was really a, little, a lot of stress. I was staying in a home with a husband, wife, and two boys. And it seemed like someone was always sick. So every morning for breakfast with my kasha, they call their, mix, their cereal kasha, I would eat a bulb of garlic. Not a clove, a bulb of garlic. Yeah. Now the good thing about that, and I, I, I experience this every day because I go in this, their living room. In Ukraine, it, almost everyone lives in apartments and every room has a door. So I... I'm in the living room studying, and someone would walk in, <laughs> go right back out again. <laughs> no one will get near you. You don't have to wear a mask. Just go, <laughs> and everyone scatters out there. But I didn't get sick that time. So I took care of myself. So the basic foundation principle of health is reason from cause to effect. If you get sick, think back. What did I do? And this is a very important thing. If someone comes to you and say, 
man, I, 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 I'm not feeling good. Well, how long have you felt this way? And I'm going to be talking about this tomorrow. Very important questions. How long have you been feeling this way? What happened when it first happened? Did you start taking a new drug? Did you have a major life event? Someone died, you got fired, you got married, that's trauma. Lots of different things they, they could talk about there, but we're trying to find out what's causing the problem. Um, so reason from cause to effect. On top of the foundation, there's three golden pillars. The first golden pillar is the life is in the blood. That's from Leviticus, okay? Where do we get our blood from? Don't say Red Cross. Where do we get our blood from? Don't say your bone marrow. Where do we get our blood from? Well, God put it in there in the first place. The food that we eat. Whatever you eat is going to be building your blood. Do you know the, the old saying, garbage in? That's right. You eat garbage, what kind of blood are you going to have? Garbage blood. It just isn't going to be. So we need to, to have good blood. That's the first golden pillar what we put into our bodies. Second golden pillar, you can have the best blood in the world, but if you don't have the second golden pillar, it's worthless. Perfect health requires a perfect circulation, exactly right. And if you don't have good circulation, you're up, you're up a creek. All right, so somebody's got high cholesterol. What do most people with Babylonian minds do if they have high cholesterol? Take a statin drug. Do you realize taking a statin drug increases your risk of diabetes between 42 and 73%? Why would you take it? What's the best way to reduce your cholesterol? Don't eat it. Where does cholesterol come from? Okay. Is, is cholesterol important? Is HDL cholesterol important? That's called the good cholesterol. Is LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, is that important? If I took, if I could sit and say, Poof, and take all your LDL, you, you would collapse as a big skin balloon puddle on the floor because it keeps your, your cells together. It's good to have, but our liver, our liver produces all that we need. You don't need to get any from another animal that had a liver. Now, that said, how many of you knew Dr. Agatha Thrash, you knew of Dr. Agatha Thrash, okay? I traveled with her over this country many, many times, and she had a familial weakness. She had a genetic defect that she overproduced cholesterol. And she was rigid with her diet. I've never known anyone so rigid. You know, it's always funny, um, we'd be at camp meetings and she'd be sitting there eating and people would be walking by. What's Dr. Thrash eating? <laughs> why, why, who cares what Dr. Thrash is eating? What are you eating? Look at your own tray. Well, she died of a stroke because she overproduced. Dr. Calvin Thrash, now we're talking about two of the leading people in, in self-reporting natural medicine. She dies of a stroke. He died of malignant melanoma. As a child, he lived in Gay, Georgia. His father grew cotton, and that boy was sunburned the whole summer. That lays the foundation for it. And he, but he fought it for 17 years. He did pretty well, because most people don't live very long with malignant melanoma. So we, we got the second golden pillar. That's perfect health requires perfect circulation. How can we increase our circulation? Well, let me just go, before I go to that, we talked about how if you take a statin drug, it increases your risk of diabetes. Now, if you have a Babylonian mind, what are you going to do about the diabetes? You're going to take a, a sugar-lowering drug. A large study that was done showed that people who took drugs to lower their, their had diabetes to lower their blood sugar had a 20% greater risk of dying than people who did not control it with medications. Diabetes is one of the easiest diseases to control. What type of disease is type 2 diabetes? What? It's a lifestyle disease or an endocrine problem. What type of a disease is type 1 diabetes? 
That's an autoimmune disease. Autoimmune. Something has attacked your beta cells in your pancreas, killed the islets of Langerhans, you're no longer producing insulin, and now you gotta be on the shop the rest of your life. Oh, do you? Dr. Heinrich had some interesting things about to say about that, but we won't go there. All right, the third golden pillar, and this is what we're gonna be talking about tomorrow, is to, to me the most important one, your attitude about life. Is that important? Do you realize that during this, this lockdown, this quarantine, all this going on, suicides amongst young people have skyrocketed? They've lost their social group. They're depressed. They're sitting in their rooms. They can't go out. They can't socialize. Far more people in California committed suicide than uh, young people than died of COVID. It's, it's a tragedy. I mentioned that the second person I feel was my mother. <clears throat> Rarely in my whole life did I ever see my mother unhappy. And my father was, uh, was very abusive to her and to me especially and my sisters to a lesser degree, but it was never happy. But she was always positive around us. Um, I'll show you a picture uh, tomorrow afternoon of my mother on her 90th birthday. You know, you'll see her picture and you'll sit there and think, first of all, she can't be 90. Second of all, that is one happy looking lady. What does it say in Proverbs 17, 22? A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit? Do you realize that people with depression have more osteoporosis? Now, this was written by Solomon a thousand years before Christ, and yet it is proven by medical science today. It's amazing. You, yes. 17, 20, Proverbs 17.22. A merry heart. See, you learn how to sing them. You never forget them. Now, most of you, some of you were in my, my age group. I walk into a store, they're playing music from the 60s. Without my permission, I'm singing it. Hey, Jude, don't do it. Oh, no, don't, don't say that. Don't say that. You know, because it becomes a part of you. And Satan knows this, but so does God. We take his words and combine it with music. David and Jesus Christ were always singing the scriptures. It will rivet it into your mind. And the day's coming. What does it say in Psalm um, 119, verse 11? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. His word is our protection. When we see the temptation come, we say, Lord, you promise there's no temptation that's, you know, whatever. You, you claim the promise for the situation. I know I, w I was in um, Bogenhofen. You ever heard of Bogenhofen, Pastor? It's a seminary in Austria. Um, Frank Hossel, who's now at Andrews. Um, how many have read A Thousand Shall Fall? Oh, I love it. Uh, well, his son, Gerhard Hossel, was a professor, and he spoke at the, at the Gulf States Conference Deacons and Elders meeting. The guy was fantastic. And now his son, um, he was a professor there at, at Bogenhof, and then he's at Andrews right now. But uh, why am I telling you this whole story about them? I'll think about it in a minute. <laughs> Forgetting, I get off on these tangents. But um, putting verses to music, yeah, something about that. Well, whatever it was, um, oh, this it was a good point. Hmm? The book, yes, the a thousand shall fall. But that's how I was. I, I can't remember what I was thinking about. It was a great thought. I'll probably think about it tonight. I'll wake up in the middle of the night and say, why did I remember that? <laughs> but happiness. Hmm? Attitude. attitude. Happiness. Attitude. It's, it's everything. Um, my mother had a great attitude. You know, my family is known for longevity. 
I had an uncle died at 107. My great grandmother, who was born in, let me see, yeah, I remember this. She was born in 1871, I think it was. She died when I was a senior in college. What a privilege to grow up with that. But you know, I was a kid. I didn't, I didn't pick her mind about. Would you love to be with somebody now who who grew up? back before electricity and cars and all that stuff. I, did, I was too full of myself. Um, her daughter, my grandmother, lived to be 96. My mother lived to be 96. My grandparents on the other side lived into their 90s. My do- father died at 57. Let me just, since I started late, I'm going I'm to indulge myself and just tell you a story. <clears throat> I was in the military One day, my father, he just started bleeding. His eyes, his ears, his nose, his mouth. His liver had quit working. They took him to the hospital. I had three sisters. Two of them were nurses. They were there at the hospital. My one sister, who lives not far from me, a couple hours from me, she was in the trauma unit with them, and they were putting units of blood in, and it kept pouring out. Finally, she just signaled, don't waste your blood. And she held my father as he died. And she wrote me a letter a few years later. She says, when dad died, there was a look of hopeless, helpless pleading on his face. She couldn't help him. She wasn't, she wasn't, she couldn't help my father. She couldn't help her father. Well, when she wrote that, I say, I vowed, I say, Lord, I never want someone to die in front of me with hopeless, helpless pleading on their faces. And 10 years later, I'm the resident at UT Pines uh, Anavoli, the Lifestyle Center. We had a patient who was from New England. He'd had a stroke. And they took him to the hospital. They says, bad stroke. You've also got cancer. Then he had more strokes. And a, a friend of theirs came and says, you've got to send him to UT Pines. This guy had come there 10 years before with terminal cancer. And he's still sending his patients. So they brought him down to Uchi Pines. After a few days, he lost his ability to speak. He kept having strokes. He was just, he couldn't even get out of bed. They brought the son and daughter down because they knew this, he was going to die. One night, I'm sleeping, knock on my door. It's his wife. She says, Don, Willard's restless, and I'm too tired. I says, I found a place for her to sleep. I went in there, and he was in the middle of the bed, just flailing about, you know, just going to town. So I get up there, I'm trying to keep him from rolling off the bed and hurting himself, and then he stopped, as still as a stone. He looked right at me, and he said two words. Now, the interesting thing was, only two people at UT Pines could have understand, understood the import of those two words. One was Dr. Agatha Thrash, and I can guarantee you, she would not have been on a bed wrestling with a man in Anavoti that night. She was a pilot. I'm a pilot. The two words were flight, readiness. There was a magazine in the military called Flight Readiness, and basically, if you've ever gone for a flight, looking at the window, you see your plane, you'll see one of the guys, usually the guy with the three things, looking around, looking at the wings, looking at the hydraulics, looking at the tires, because when you're up there, you don't want to figure out you've got a problem with your tires. You've got to be flight ready because once you take off, you've got to come down. You want to come down in one piece. Flight readiness. And God spoke to me. He says, Don, I'm getting ready to launch Willard. His name was Willard. Into eternity. Get him ready. What would you do? I rolled off that bed and I started praying out loud for Willard. I just praying, 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 and I look up and see if he's dead yet. He's still, you're looking at me. I'm praying some more. <laughs> Praying, praying, praying. I look up, he's looking at me, and I, three times I did that, and finally I said, well, I about prayed out. And so on the bookcase, the book, the, the nightstand, we, every patient got five books. I grabbed Desire of Ages. They, I, have Ivy lifted up, will draw all men unto me. I flipped it open, I just started reading, 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 reading. And he laid there, still as a stone, looking and listening. He didn't die that night. He didn't die the next day. We get the last day of the session, and um, I'm in his room. His wife is out talking with somebody. 
Um, we had a German surgeon there, Bernard Majoric. We had Joseph Onneman from Ghana. We had Angel Adley from Bermuda and me. And Dr. Majoric says, perhaps we should sing him a song. I says, yes, let's sing in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Okay, we sing it. And so then Angelo and Joseph went to get fomentations for his liver. Dr. Majoric went out to talk with the wife. I'm tired. I sit in a chair, and I'm starting to doze off, and all of a sudden something changed in the room. I knew something was different. And I walked over to the side, and Willard was looking at me, and I saw that he was in the process of dying. I says, Willard, keep your eyes on Jesus. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. And I just said it until he was gone. Mm. God gave me the opportunity 10 years after my father died mm. to help this man. And I can only pray that, what, folks, you're going to be in the presence of somebody who's dying. I was just last September, I was driving out to Utah to do a uh, survival week of prayer for Daystar Academy. And there was a man laying in the middle of Interstate 70 with a puddle of blood, his head broken open, brain showing in the whole nine yards. And some guy was holding his head and, you know, with his bare hands. So I grabbed my medical bag or my first aid kit came out and gave him some stuff. And I just leaned down and I talked to the guy. I don't know. He had agonal breathing. I could not get any. I couldn't find pulse anywhere. But I whispered in his head, I said, brother. Jesus loves you. I just talked about Jesus mm -hmm. until the medics came and then they took him away. Mm -hmm. Folks, the number one purpose of a medical missionary, you know what that is? Is to get people ready to die. Mm -hmm. If you get them ready to die, are they ready to live? Mm -hmm. If you don't get them ready to die, are they ready to die? No. You got to get them ready to live. Uh, ready to die. If you've done that, you've accomplished your mission. Mm -hmm. Lift up Christ. It's your job. You plant the seeds. Holy Spirit will water the seeds. Okay, tomorrow morning we're going to talk about Christ's method. You probably all know what Christ's method alone will bring to success in reaching the people. We're going to try to expand that out a little bit. But we've got to be able to be personal with people. We've got to do what Christ did. And we're going to look at some amazing Bible verses that Christ gave us in that last long conversation with his disciples. Basically, um, John 13 through 16 was him just talking to his disciples. And we're going to see something very interesting in those verses we'll look at tomorrow morning. So let's have a word of prayer, and I'll let you go. Father, we are thankful for this opportunity to spend time with you this evening. The Sabbath is coming on. It's a special time of blessing. I pray that we could wring every blessing out of the Sabbath that you have placed in it for us. And I just pray you'd help us to be your healing hands in this very, very hurting world. And I thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.